Awesome. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to our Ergonauts Mission Control. Um, again, this is more of a town hall forum where we uh, can ask questions uh, to our presenter today, Dr. Greg Pitts. Uh, Nicole will also present and Steve will also say some words. So you can uh, type in the questions you have or you can uh, wait for them at the end. It's uh, again, kind of very open hall um, forum type. So thanks once again for joining us. And like, yep, like I said, Nicole's gonna be our one of our presenters, Steve and Dr. Greg Pitts. <clears throat> Starting off today with our rules of engagement, uh, like we always talk about, um, just anytime we uh, start one of these off, we like to remind everyone just to be respectful of everybody's uh, questions, and you know, don't talk over everybody. And if one of the big things, if you could just leave your camera on for the for the entirety of the mission control, if you can, that'd be great for us. And uh, again, we'll start off with the anatomy of an injury. Dr. Greg Pitts is going to go over risk today, and he's got a really good presentation. And then Nicole will go over the Ergo Ago office platform, a little bit about that. And then we can go over questions, and Steve will then talk about our sponsors. And there'll be probably people joining us as we uh, <clears throat> as we continue on. I know uh, some people are a few minutes late. We got Mr. James Golden. Um, Mr. James, if you don't mind turning on your camera, that would be very much appreciated just so we can kind of get to know you. Sweet. Yeah. We will continue on with Dr. Greg Pitts. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen, and Dr. Greg Pitts will share his and start talking about wrist. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad everyone's here tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the radial side of the wrist. I cut this up into two lectures, and the reason why is because both sides have a lot of different pathologies that can occur from work injuries. Uh, they're relatively common injuries. There'll be a few that I will discuss that aren't common but can cost people a lot of money if people get these injuries. We'll talk about the pathology. We'll talk about the estimated costs, which are relatively firm. I've looked at this a lot with a, a large automobile industry uh, in the recent past, and uh, also talk about some risk factors that cause these injuries. Please slow me down. I talk extremely fast, and uh, sometimes I'll use medical jargon, so please say, hey, what are you talking about here? What are you saying? Slow me down. Shut me up, and I'll try to, to uh, do a better job of explaining it. So I'm going to share my screen now, and I'm going to go into a mirror mode where you can see my app. And we'll go into the, the wrist and the wrist anatomy, which um, is pretty pretty cool to consider and look at. Um, and we're going to look at the radial wrist or the, the thumb side of the wrist, if you will. The radial or thumb side of the wrist is called that because the anatomy that we're talking about um, lives um, on the radius and around the radius, uh, which is going to be here. And so... Um, I'll layer in some muscles and we'll start talking right away. So the first pathology we're going to talk about today is, is a phenomenon called intersection syndrome. Intersection syndrome. So this is not a common pathology, but it can be very debilitating. So you'll have a lot of centralized swelling that will occur in this zone right here. And this pathology is made up of four different tendons. And the tendon, the tendon that moves your thumb when you open your hand up real wide like you're grabbing a jar, the abductor pollicis, abductor pollicis longus. Then you have the second tendon, which is extensor pollicis brevis. When you raise your thumb up, that tendon will, will make that action. They ride on top of two tendons that control your wrist, the extensor carpi radialis brevis and longus. So... For whatever reason, there was a you know there's a lot of muscles that cross the wrist, and and this is an intersection between these two sets of muscles, the thumb movers and the wrist movers. Well, these cross over. So when you're doing a lot of activities like a large reach envelope or a large reach envelope with your hand at, with your thumb open wide with a lot of weight, and you do a lot of repetitive motion with large reach envelopes, it's going to make that that muscle and these tendons grind against each other. And so these tendons are covered with a tendon sheath. And so it creates friction. 
And these tennis sheets are actually designed to di diminish friction. But if you do a lot of activities with larger envelopes, with a lot of with large objects, with a lot of wrist uh, radial deviation going up and down, uh, where you move your wrist uh, going to the owner side of your wrist and back up to your radial side, or like have, holding a heavy tool or a tool that's got uh, no counterbalance on it, that's got the the air hose coming from the bottom instead of from the top, uh, where they have to hold the air hose and the tool or a lot of tool with a lot of reach, you're going to get this problem, and this problem can be solved relatively easy um with um simple modifications with reach or with counterbalance of the tools or with the size of the tool itself either too small or too big but um but this can be easily solved but you have to evaluate the work situation what's going to what's this thing going to cost you well we can um you can look at somewhere between one and five k with conservative treatment in other words you find it right away you get a get a good diagnosis, get an injection, get a splint, rest. Uh, they'll be off work about three weeks and go back to work and should be fine for most cases. But if you wait till it becomes a big problem and they have to do surgery and fix it, surgery and fix this, then you're looking at um, a situation. Sorry about that. Well, I'm technical difficulties here. If they have to do surgery and fix this animal. Then you're then you're looking at money ranging from thirty to fifty k, with lost time days in the range of between twelve and fifteen weeks. That's a lot of money and a lot of time for small changes that can occur with ergonomic changes. So, things to think about there uh, with this particular problem. The next thing up we're going to talk about, and I'm going to add a little bit of anatomy with this this next one, is going to be the. Um, Dequervin's tenosynovitis. So a lot of people have heard about Dequervin's. It's a relatively common pathology. We see it with pregnant mothers. They get it, and women just have give birth. They pick the babies up out of the crib. And what happens basically <clears throat> is that you have a very thick fibrous tendon sheath that holds this tendon that, that's, that straightens up your thumb and this tendon that straightens up your thumb. They are caught between a bony, a bony floor the two tendons, and a very ligamentous roof. And these tendons have a tendon sheath around them. And both the ligament and the bone are very non-yielding. And so when you're doing a lot of, again, repetitive wrist flexion extension, heavy tools, uh, non-counterbalanced tools, tools with vibration, a lot of repetition, uh, these, these tendons can become inflamed. Well, they have no place to go. So they have no place to go because they've got bone on one side and ligament on the other. And so they develop... They become thickened and they become inflamed. So remember that tendons, when the when they become inflamed, they they produce pain mediators like histamines, mast cells, uh, prostaglandins, uh, P substance, and all those chemicals create pain. And so when they stay there for a long time, so if you don't get rest because they're trapped, this is all trapped in this sheath. If they don't get if they don't get attention and and, and taken care of, and they keep doing this over a period of time. These tendon sheaths can become fibrotic and change from being swollen to becoming fibrotic, almost like scar tissue. They're going to have surgery. So the non-surgical treatment is to have an injection, an injection put in with some medicine, put into the sheath, which will, which will, it's cortisone injection, which will, um, with a cortisone injection and with a form based on spica and with activity modification, 85 to 90 percent get better with that treatment algorithm and usually going back to work within three to five weeks if not they're going to have surgery to release the sheath the surgeon will release the sheath clean out the tendons and sew the sheath back up and you're going to be out somewhere between 12 to 16 weeks and so the first batch the conservative measure is going to be again between one and five k the not the, the surgical cases is non-surgery the surgery case is going to cost you 50 plus all based upon, again, too much repetition, awkward postures, torquing, large reach envelopes, non-counterbalanced tools, tools with handles that are too large or too small, tools that expose the hand to vibration, which makes the, the hand work too hard. The reason why vibration is an enemy to most every pathology in the upper extremity is because vibration shuts down the goji tendon organs in our, in our body, which, which control force regulation. So if you ever, anybody's ever done any weed eating, 
they go out and you look at your hands after about half an hour of weed eating, you'll see your hands are real, real white. They, they push all the blood out. Reason why is because the vibration has numbed the, 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 the body's ability to control force or have force regulation, and control force. So as a result, they have a lot of problems and they overwork their hands and they do too much effort and therefore they cause tendonitis and pain and discomfort. So it's a really big deal. So moving hey, on, Chris. next, next. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, if you don't mind me asking, what, what, uh, like early signs and symptoms, what, what should employers be looking for? Uh, you know, they're going to be looking for, they're going to have pain right at their wrist. They're going to have pain right at their wrist, right below their thumb, right here. Right. It's probably going to be swollen and kind of hot looking. Uh-huh. Um, the patient's going to complain about moving their wrist back and forth. It's going to be, it's going to be pretty excruciating pain. They're going to be in pain almost at the point of tears at times. Early so on. Early, be, early on, it'll be, it'll be pain. It'll be aching pain. It'll be mild swelling. It's going to be right below your thumb joint, right at your wrist, right, right on this radial side of the wrist. Mm -hmm. Very specific. Right with the wrist, when you look at, when you bend your wrist, you see the crease. That's where it's going to be. Right, right on the right, right, right below your thumb, that crease. If you look, push your thumb up like a like hitchhiking, and then look, look right below your your wrist and bring your wrist towards your body, and that right where that crease is, that's where it's going to be, right below your thumb, and it's going to be extremely painful, and it can be like I said, swollen, hot, uh, particularly on thinner humans that you're going to be able to see it, and it's going to be it's going to be bad if you jump on it early, get into therapy early, evaluate early. Um, and then look at your risk factors. You can prevent other people from getting it, but also get them to the doctor early so they can they can be treated. A small injury is going to be much less costly than a large injury. And this can go south very fast, particularly in your older population. It's more prevalent in females and males, uh, but it, but both can get it. And um, it's very, very debilitating. Uh, it's one of the more painful um, tendonitis that we see in the hand. Any other questions? The the one that you mentioned before, the pathology you talked about the first time, what what uh -huh. would be early signs and symptoms on that, Greg? Swelling, swelling and pain focal to that area. So I'll take the connective tissue off. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, connective tissue off. So right where these these two intersect, if you take your fingers and go down to the base of the thumb and take four fingers from the base of the thumb and go up the wrist, you can almost see it where, where you can see like a bump, natural bump. If you make a fist, you can see that natural bump that's on the, that's on the arm. Yeah. And you can see it really, you can see it probably make a fist. That's the intersection. And that's going to become swollen and painful. Like I said, this is, this prevalence is not very high. As I say, the Quervis probably happens 50 to one versus intersection, but they <clears> both are debilitating. If you miss them or if you catch them early, it's great. If you miss them, it's bad. Um, and, um, the, uh, the, the, that's one reason why people do a lot of, uh, early symptom investigation. They do a lot of surveillance of the employees before they start to work that day. Who has a pain or discomfort? Please let me know. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but in the long run, it pays for itself because you can catch things very early and you can use, um, uh, non OSHA recorded, uh, procedures to hopefully head them off. But if they got a problem, you, you know, and it, it's pretty obvious and you got to you, you send them, but the quicker you find them, the smaller problem. If you can avoid surgery, you're going to, your, your cost is going to be one tenth of what it would cost with surgery and lost time days. I have a question. Do you yes, sir. know about uh, the, like the dose or dose rate factors for some of these things? You know, I, I wish, right. I, I wish there was a, a, a book that would tell us dose ratio. So we talk about repetitive motion a lot. But there's really no dose relationship to injury that's been published. Um, we try to look at, you know, the combination of risk factors. So the large reach envelope, the awkward postures, repetitive motion, uh, the heavy excessive forces, those things add up. So if you can eliminate, you know, all but maybe maybe you can eliminate everything but, but repetitive motion. There are some really good models out there on excessive force, particularly as it relates to the dose of repetition. And so... Some of the studies that have been published, um, if you go, the, the arm is really interesting because when you hit certain percentages of, of maximum voluntary effort, the amount of blood flow changes in the upper extremity, which causes injury. So if you work at 10% of your maximum effort, you can work continuously. So if you so say your grip strength is 100 pounds, so if that, the work that you're doing with your hand is at 10 pounds, and the muscles in your hand are not going to get tired throughout the course of the day. We're doing that same job. But if you go to 30% of your max, 
let's say now the, the force is at 30 pounds and your rib strength is 100, you have 50% blood flow occlusion of the upper extremity. So you're going to have a very much higher chance of having injury with that, with that load, with doing repetitive activities with that load. If you go to 70% of your max and you're doing, if you're doing more than occasional activities, 70% of your max, you have 100% blood flow occlusion. In other words, all the blood flow cuts off down to your hand and arm. That means your nerve doesn't have any nutrition, your tendons don't have any nutrition, your joint has no nutrition. And as a result, you can actually have a high incidence of injuries. And so it's very important to get an ergonomist in there or somebody that, that knows what they're doing and actually evaluate the forces of the patient or the workers are exposed to versus their capacity. So that's why we always engineer to the 40-year-old female's grip strength on the line to, to ensure that we're not going to hurt, but everybody can do that, that activity. So, so we do 10% of the max effort of a 40% 40 year old female, which is going to be somewhere around 75 pounds. So if we can engineer the activity down to where it's seven pounds or less when they're doing repetitive activities, like repetitive gripping, then we will have a less chance of having injury from that force factor. Does that, does that help? Yes. Thank you. Well, you know, and, and I think too, and, and you you've talked about it, Greg, in your uh, in the previous uh, sessions. You were saying that those when you stack those risk factors, like uh, you know, this is one thing as far as you know, ten percent. But then you said when you get into a tooling and awkward posture, and you stack the the different risk factors, you know that that's a reason. That's a reason it's hard. I think. You know, from what you told us in the past, uh, yep, as you're you, right. You're exactly right. You, you try to mitigate as many risk factors as possible. And right. so if you can check the force, you can check the awkward posture, you can set, check the tool design, all those things make a difference in production. And really what we're after with, the, with, with, with ergonomics is about helping production, helping lean production be better. So it's, it's about production and quality. Safety is a byproduct. So uh, preventing this injury is preventing waste because the injury is waste. Injury, injury is muda. It's waste. And so if you have an injury, it's waste. It costs the company to pay for this. You know, so if they're making, if they're building a car and the car costs 25,000 and the injury costs 50, you're like, you've, you've, you've burned two cars. You know, I mean, you can look at it different ways, but the bottom line is, is you lose production and you lose quality. And then, then, then you have that injury. And so you lose a trained, skilled employee to do the job. It's, it's a huge cost to the company. It's hard to replace people. It's hard to replace people that's trained. So the more proactive we are with eliminating risk factors, well, the better off we'll be. And also looking at the, there's going to be some jobs we can't. So that, that's why you have job rotation to rotate people in and out of heavy jobs and light jobs. So you don't, so you try to mitigate, mitigate that way through exposure, through limiting, limiting, limiting exposure. The next topic I have, and I'll take some tennis off. The next, the next one we have is actually OA, osteoarthritis of the thumb. Now, why do I bring this up? Which it's a common problem. It's often it's confused between the thumb and the tendons that lived here. But the thumb arthritis, you know, the, the aging population is hitting us right now very hard, and this is going to be a big, big issue in the next five to eight years. Is thumb arthritis? I've got it on both hands, left worse than right but I've got it and it's very tough on people. So when they have to use hand tools, they have to use power tools and they are exposed to vibration. Um, and it can be, it can be fine motor dexterity, gross motor dexterity. What happens is, is the body fails and it actually, the ligament that holds, that holds this thumb in place, it holds this thumb anchored. It becomes lax and the thumb migrates out the back. Well, cartilage can take a lot of force this way, back and forth, back and forth. Cartilage has no pain receptors. But when the thumb starts doing this back and forth this way, it starts shedding the cartilage off. And when it sheds the cartilage off, you get bone on bone. Periosteum or skin skin on the bone has a tremendous number of pain fibers. So that's why arthritis hurts is because your body has shedded away the, the um, uh, I'm sorry, shedded away the cartilage. And so you're stuck with bone on bone. And so it's very, very painful. It becomes inflamed. It becomes swollen. The, the joint sets out the back side of the hand. And so it looks, it look, it's kind of sets about like it sets out like this, where you have it kind of looks like a shoulder, has a shoulder sign to it. So you, how do you know they got it? The, the thumb will look like it's got a big bump or knot on the back of where the thumb sets. The, the joint is migrated out dorsally. 
It occurs <laughs> females in the fourth decade of life and males in the fifth. And you're going to see a lot of it. And if you catch it early, you try to adapt your tools, change the force vectors. It goes a lot to change, change the, the amount of force that you use with the hands, change the dexterity. Uh, you can adapt the tools and make them a little bit bigger, about 2.5 inches around. We'll, we'll save the thumb. Um, so you can get a nice uh, custom fit orthotic to help control it. Uh, short term, if you find it right away and you get mitigation, it's going to cost you one to three K. If you, if you go to surgery, this one's going to cost you. It's going to cost two ways. It's going to cost you about 50 to 80 K depending upon the, the, the impact of how long they're off work. They're going to be off work a minimum of 12 weeks. And uh, they're probably not going to be able to go back to the same job ever. So if they're, they're, they'll, they will have to change occupations within your company. This is a life changing event. And we've got, Millions of Americans walking around with it right now. It's a, it's a time bomb waiting to happen. And it, it's sitting there. And in Kentucky, if you aggravate it, you own it. So this this may be from, from wear and tear. But if you aggravate it with your job, you own it. The, 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 the plant owns it. I'm open for questions with this one. I know Anybody? you're going to get around to it, but... Uh... You know what, and you you're right. If it's uh, even if it's a pre-existing circumstance and it's a it's aroused by work-related activity, <laughs> here's the thing I see, and I hear a lot of people talking about it. We we're not even talking about the boomers. Uh, what's the what's the text thumb? You know, everybody I know is like, oh my god, my thumbs kill me. Yep. Folks are going around like this all the time. Yeah. Yep. Is that what's happening in there or? Well, it's, it, it can be, it's a combination of two things and I'll show it to you. It's a combination of this joint, the CMC joint, this joint problem and this joint. So what happens is there's a tendon and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll flip this hand around. There's a tendon that lives right on your thumb. I'll add some muscles. This tendon right here, right here, this tendon becomes inflamed right at the joint. And so in the young, this becomes inflamed. It's called trigger thumb. Right. And this young, this thumb can become very, very ag aggravated, and, and the tendon sheath can become inflamed, and uh, they can have a lot of pain with that. They also can have a little bit of pain with the ligamentous structures that hold the thumb together. The, the ligament structures hold the thumb together here because the phone can be too big for the, for, the, for the kid's hands. So the ligament gets hurt. The tendon gets hurt. And, it, and if they don't rest their hand, which a lot of times they won't because they're so freaking addicted to the phone – that it's hard to mitigate this. Oftentimes we'll have to make a holder or something for the phone so they won't hold it with their hand open. They'll hold it with their hand closed. Now, oftentimes you got those little things stick on the back, of the, the back of the phone. You can, you know, how you hold it with just that little sticky, I don't know what you call them, but it goes on the back and they can hold it. That helps mitigate it. Uh, but but the, if, it's a, if it's a dominant hand, they're actually typing with that thumb. It's hard to stop it. It really is. We, we go to voice, we go to voice activation. We tried some different things, but it's really hard to control this population with this particular problem. Yeah. But in the industry with, with workers, you'll see this trigger thumb as well occur and uh, left untreated trigger thumb. So if they're doing a lot of heavy thumb pinching, thumb activities, that this tendon can become extremely inflamed and it's going to be painful right at that, that second joint up right below, right. If you look at the tip of your thumb and go down, down the second joint, it's going to be right in that crease on the on the on the top portion of their hand and it's gonna be extremely painful put skin in here and i drive it's gonna be right here the pain is just gonna be right here here greg and you so, want to point it out on mine <laughs> she, sorry she has you, you treated her for trigger thumb oh that's right that's right yeah it's 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 a painful out it's very painful mm -hmm. and uh it can be uh, extremely costly to the employer. And you're looking at, if you catch it early and get an injection and shut them down, they're back to work in three weeks. If you wait and let this become a stage three trigger finger, they're, they're going to be costing you thirty, forty thousand dollars for for a rehab and for being off work. It's a big deal. Yeah, it's a really big deal. Um, and I think that you know when, when we ask like where these other places are, I can I can zoom out and kind of catch back up. Um, so you know, intersection syndrome, Steve is right here. The Quervins is right here. The uh, CMC arthritis is right here. And then we we talked about the trigger thumb. Trigger thumb is over is over here. Let me see if I can slip this around real quick. Trigger thumb occurs right here. The the other 
big, big pathology that can cost companies a lot of money, particularly with tools that create torque. So you guys have been in, in, in plenty of plants where you see people using using torque wrenches, power torque wrenches. They don't have a they don't have a, a torque set on it where, where, where it will stop a counter torque setting on on the tool itself. And so the, these these plants that don't have that in place. That that wrench will hit hit us and keep on spinning, keep on turning, and it will torque out of the hand, and it will cause a ligament injury in the thumb. We'll pull this up here. It causes a ligament injury right right here, right there, the ligament that holds the two bones together, and that can be a big deal. If the ligament is completely torn, it's going to cost the employer between sixty and eighty thousand dollars minimum to fix this. And so, so just putting a simple device in where you have, where you take the torque out of the wrench. It has a torque setting on it. It has counter torque settings, and, and has a gravity uh, um, counter force uh, on the on the tools set at where the the force is not is not multiplied by uh, by non counterbalance. It becomes a big deal. Yeah, and, so, and I'll tell you. Uh, no, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, you know, you see, Greg, we see, I see that a lot in. Uh, I actually see it a lot in construction. Because people will, they'll grab a tool and like it's, you know, it's common to cut bolts off when we're doing demo and somebody will use a grinder eight hours a day. And so they oh, got, yeah. they got, yeah, they got vibration and then they've oh, got, yeah. you can see their hands snap every single time. <laughs> and it's not, it's not long at their Walgreens buying a splint. Oh, and, uh, oh man. Yeah. It's a big deal, Steve. It's really a big deal, and and, and people, it's it is so easily fixed. You can spend a you can spend five hundred dollars on 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 or thousand dollars on a counterbalance and 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 uh, an anti torque built into the uh, into the, the tool and save thousands of dollars in injuries and also increase production. And and so it's 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 it you increase production, increase quality, and and actually keep you from getting these injuries. Mm-hmm. And this is called a gamekeeper's thumb. In the literature, it's right the the UCL injury, UCL ligament injury, and it's a very costly. So you know you got your CMC arthritis, you got your ligament injury here. Those are two biggies. They're going to be fifty plus easy, no problem. Fifty plus easy if they're, if they're surgicals, and they can be prevented with with very little money. And these are big big injuries to cost industry a lot of money. Hey, is you? Um, uh, is- it, no, I was just going to say, as you slide down through there, we uh, we got one of our favorite product manufacturers on here, uh, James Golden. He he has a uh, product that that they work with called Mousetrapper. We actually, and it's an office product, and it's a keyboard. You know, when you look at some of these, and you know, as, as you go through, if you don't mind, hit on some of the things that you see because we, we're talking about manufacturing those kind of things but you know from an office perspective it, it, you know you see a lot of people walk around office with a with a, a splint they're self-splinted and yep. you, if you don't mind t- touch on some of those things because we uh, yeah, James they, good, yeah. they're all going to be the, what i what i've been saying before you know, all these all these pathologies I'm talking about can happen with office workers as well. You know, your dequerment is a big one for office workers. And so if they have a keyboard set and too high, or they have keyboards uh, that are too small, that their hands are going too small, it puts the hands in awkward postures for long periods of time. Uh, if you have a, a, a worker that um, is doing an excessive amount of mousing and they don't have a mouse caddy in place and they're having a large reach envelope, it's going to put a lot of force on the wrist they're going to rest their wrist and hand uh, on on the table itself with the weight of their arm if they got a large reach envelope with the mouse, which is going to be a big problem. Um, if you got if you got pre you know, if you got arth- wrist arthritis, I'm sorry, thumb arthritis here, the quervens is here, CMC arthritis is here. It's going to show up uh, over a period of time by using if the mouse is too big. You've seen some of these huge mouses that are really big, or if they're really, or if they're if they're if they have a hard surface area, they're resting their hand on versus a uh, just a mouse pad. Something as simple as that, or a wrist rest by their. Uh, by their keyboard can make a big difference in the amount of stress that, that happens on the tendons and on the joint itself, which makes a huge difference in production. So the size of the keyboard, the reach envelope, the mouse design, the the wrist rest, the chair design, all those things play a huge role in production and quality and then safety. And those things are really big and, and they're relatively expensive mm-hmm. nowadays. I mean, it's where you can do an ergonomic uh, uh, change in, in, in an office relatively cheap. 
uh, with great production changes and 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 makes the work environment much safer. Mm-hmm. Um, the is that is that um, yeah that, question, question? yeah I was just I was just curious and you know we uh, I see people walking I see more people walking around right now with with like drugstore splints on their hand than I've ever seen in my life. Check out, you know, people on check checkers at, at when they used to have them at Walmart or the grocery store before I took their job. But you still see it, you know, as they come through. Oh, it's yeah. Uh, so yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the, the the two biggies you see are people try to splint their thumbs. Mm-hmm. And so they'll try to splint for, for the, the Quervins or for the CMC arthritis. The problem is the alpha shell splints, a lot of them were not designed function so they put the thumb out way out into abduction and so they really can't use it to pick things up or do things with so they oftentimes take it off or not wear it mm-hmm. where the custom splint will put the will put the thumb in a, in a in the appropriate position where they can do active adls and pick things up uh so there are a few good custom uh, a few off the splints that are good uh Comfort Cool makes a, a really good uh, neoprene orthotic that's a pretty decent orthotic. It's off the shelf. It's probably the most popular orthotic in the, in the world for thumb uh, for thumb pain, for dequervins, and for CMC arthritis. The other one is 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 um, a product out called Push, and there's a new one out uh, coming soon uh, that will be coming from a vendor that's going to be really good. I, I really can't talk about it right now, but the bottom line is there are some good orthotics out there. But some of them are, 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 they'll have thumb pain, but they put a wrist splint on. It's not doing anything for their thumb. Uh, the other big one that people treat, and I'll, I'll spin around and talk about it right now, I'll talk about it tonight, even if it wasn't on the agenda, is carpal tunnel syndrome. So carpal tunnel syndrome uh, is treated, it's probably the most widely known pathology in the U.S. What's interesting about the carpal tunnel is that it's got a bony surface at the bottom, carpal bones. It has four flexor tendons sitting here that bend the tips of your fingers. They're, they're very powerful muscles. You've got four more tendons sitting on top of each other like this that bend the second joint in your finger. You have an artery sitting here. You have a thumb flexor sitting here. And you have another nerve sitting here, another artery sitting over here. And this, this carpal tunnel that we talk about, this carpal tunnel right here, is if you hold up your index finger, and look at your index fingers, that's how big your carpal tunnel is. And all those structures go through that. Well, what happens is the nerve that sits up here, the nerve is a soft tissue in the body. And so these tendons become, each one of these tendons have tendon sheaths. And when you do repetitive activities, what's the tendon sheath do to, to counterforce the friction? They swell. And they swell. When they swell, they take up space and they put pressure on the nerve. And the nerve has the nerve control sensation to the thumb, the index, the middle finger, and part of the ring finger. Your hand becomes numb and tingly. So if you rest your wrist on a sharp object or you rest your wrist on a desk without a pad or you have a poorly designed desk or you have a poorly designed key, keyboard or you have a, a mouse with a large reach envelope, you're putting stress right on that nerve and then all these tenors are doing activity and they're swelling. The nerve has no place to go, so it gets compressed. When it gets compressed, it stops the signals and the tr- nutrition gets cut down to the muscles and to the nerves and to the hand. And as a result, you have numbness and tingling. You can have a, a mild neuropraxia, which is actually where the nerve just becomes crushed, but it can recover. So with rest and with appropriate orthotics, they do well. The problem is the off-the-shelf orthotics, they put your wrist in 30 degrees of extension, which puts the nerve in, in as much pressure as 30 degrees of flexion. So we all know that, that wrist flexion uh, causes stress on the hand, and that's pu- well-known published literature. So if you've got a poorly designed desk or chair, your wrist is going to flexion, it's going to put pressure on the nerve, it's going to cut the blood flow or cut the pressure on the nerve, put, it's, going to put, it's going to take nutrition away from the nerve. But 30 degrees of extension puts it in the same problem. All these off-the-shelf splints Steve's talking about puts the nerve under stress. So off-the-shelf splints should have the wrist in neutral, not in wrist extension. And there's not one off the shelf that you can buy. So you have to actually bend that stay to make it neutral to give the the nerve some relief. And most of the time people have pain at night. Why? Because we sleep in a fetal position. Our our wrists curve over into flexion and it puts pressure on the nerve, which causes nutrition problems downstream. And as a result, we have problems. We have numbness and tingling and loss of, of muscle function, particularly in the thumb. How do you know it's bad when they complain about sleeping at night? If they're losing sleep at night, you've got a big problem. You need to get them to the doctor. If they're complaining about occasional numbness and tingling, you need to rotate the job. If you see any type of wasting or loss of muscle mass here in the thumb, it's a big deal. They're they're, they're way down the road. The earlier you can identify this, the better. And the earlier you can mitigate 
uh, the office environment or the work environment, but the manufacturing environment as quick as possible by eliminating awkward postures, excessive force, large reach envelopes, vibration, um, the better off you're going to be. Micro breaks, all those stuff play a role. But if you don't do this stuff, it's going to cost you. I, I know for sure the, the carpal tunnel case is 55 plus K. A, a, a for each case, 55. If it goes to surgery, it's 55, not surgery is 45. That's that that's minimum. That's minimum. And so it's very expensive. So how much is going to how much is going to cost to get a good ergonomic, ergonomic evaluation, get a good chair, get a good keyboard, get a good. Uh, it's, it's very it's minimal. You know, you're looking at four to five hundred dollars max for versus this. It only takes one of these to wipe you out. Yeah. And, and I don't, it's, it's, it's not a hard decision to me. To, to make the difference. And we do that with all of our employees where I work at. We have, we have about 25 off 20, 20 office people and we do ergonomics for all of them and we fix it, but it's a, but it's a matter of just being proactive, being proactive is going to save you a lot of money in the long run. There's really only two more pathologies I'm going to talk about tonight and I'll shut up and let you guys uh, ask questions. But one is going to be one you don't want to miss. It's a very big game changer and it occurs right here. Okay. I'm going to take, We'll take the to take the skin away. It's called a scaphoid fracture. If an employee falls in a parking lot or they fall at work, they say, oh, my wrist hurts, get an x-ray. Get an x-ray, particularly if they have pain right around their thumb area. Get an x-ray. This this bone, uh, if it if it is broken and you miss it, and, and as a matter of fact, the first x-ray, they say it's negative. You have to get another x-ray in two weeks. And then if it's negative, then you're, you're good to go. But oftentimes this, this fracture can lay a cult and not be seen. This animal, the person, if they get a fracture and they have surgery or whatever, if they have surgery, it's going to, it could be anywhere from, from 16 weeks to 52 weeks off work. It's a big deal. So you have to be very proactive with this and make sure you get the x-ray. So if they have a fall, you're not going to get this from repetitive motion or awkward postures. It's a fall. It's traumatic. So it's got a very defined uh, injury, okay? So just saying it can happen at work. I've got three right now that are work-related. The last but not least is the ganglion cyst. And the ganglion cyst, the dorsal wrist, I'll take some more muscles off, the ganglion cyst comes between the, from the ligament between the scaphoid and the lunate. And the ganglion cyst balloons up like this, and they can become very painful and very unsightly. And so the bigger they are, the less they hurt. The small they are, they can be like small, like a BB <laughs> sit right here, the more it's going to hurt. They're going to have pain in the back of their wrist, they're going to have pain with weight bearing. They're going to complain about that. Not uncommon at all. What the kicker is with this one is that if you, if you drain them, 50% come back. If they take them out, the recovery is at least eight weeks to 12 weeks. And the cost is going to be somewhere around 30K for surgery. So be proactive. If they have pain in the back of the wrist and, and it's, you can't see it, but it's pain is persistent, then get it checked because it can be sitting there. And oftentimes they can drain it one or two times. You got a 50% chance of getting them better, but not the surgery is a big deal. So these are two big game changers around the wrist. The wrist is a big deal because um, they have a lot of moving parts. They have extreme complicated kinematics. And when these gets messed up through work activities, or they're going to, if they blame work activities for it, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, so I want to stop talking now. I'm going to relinquish my screen. And um, I do have this broken down, and I can share this, uh, just an estimate of non-surgical versus surgical costs. Um, lost time days and, or number of weeks per pathology. Uh, that that will be the, – these are, these are pretty strong, pretty accurate estimates. I'm pretty probably being conservative with these, uh, but uh, it's, uh, they can, they can be very, and to realize the fact that this money that I've gotten put up here is that um, they're going to have to put that much money in reserve that they can't touch until the case is closed. Right. So the reserve account can go way high too. And, and most people don't understand that. So they freeze money in the reserves and wait. And so if you can mitigate the reserves as well as the cost, you save the money you save the company a tremendous amount of money through just some basic common sense ergonomics, whether it be office ergonomics or plant ergonomics. And, and these are not hard to do. Matter of fact, most of the time, we know with the, with the ergo algo, it, it lets everybody have a very consistent, precise ergonomic evaluation. 
It teaches the basics of, of lean ergonomics and helps people understand and be consistent with their with their evaluation. And that helps it be fair with all the employees and be consistent. That's what's nice about this product. It's very, very thorough. And it takes the guesswork out of it. You can have you can have your office managers use it. You can have your you can have your your team leaders use it. They don't, they don't have to be a, a occupational therapist or physical therapist. It's a nice bus, but they don't have to be. It takes that level of of expertise out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, so so it makes everybody an expert in office ergonomics, and that's the truth. <clears throat> it takes the guesswork out. Matter of fact, most of the time nowadays, when I'm called in to, for to, for a console, it's usually an ADA issue. I'm calling in for ADA issues. I'm calling in for people that have extreme injuries, and we're trying to get them back to work through adaptations and, and trying to meet ADA requirements. That's usually when I'm called in. Uh, but this Ergo Algo is is, is going to be a game changer for people because it's going to help people save a lot of money and help companies be more productive, both at at home home office as well as um, in the in the in the office. Uh, at, at the work environment. So I'll answer questions, guys. Well, how can I answer? What can I answer for you? I cover a lot of data. I'm sorry. I know it's a lot of data there, but uh, it's, it's a lot of stuff there. It's in, and all these are costly. That's why, I, you know, I think early, early symptom investigation is very powerful. Ask your employees, you know, focus on find out every day. How's people feeling? How are you doing? What's going on? You know, and, and ask, and then be proactive with your ergonomics. Don't be don't be reactive. Reactive is too late. The mule's out of the barn. Be proactive. You know, help them understand what's going on. And you can do that with a very simple, 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 easy, consistent tool that doesn't cost a lot of money. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you. I want to you uh, you talked about the risk factors. What 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 do you see that's caught that cause the ganglion cysts? What what kind of what are the risk factors? Usually excessive force or a tool that does have a counterbalance on it. So they don't have the counterbalance where they get a torque and they get the wrist torqued real quick. And it actually creates a ligament injury. So you, you everybody's seen that, you know, you've been drilling all of a sudden, Turks, torques, that's going to cause it. Or a lot of, a lot of walking on your hands, like a, like a floor. When they walk on their hands a lot, they're, they're putting the carpets in, a, in, in extreme postures with weight. They're pushing a lot of heavy weight or they're, they're walking on their hands. People are, uh, house inspectors have a lot of, have a lot of stress. Um, or, you know, it can just happen. You know, it, it, this is one of those things where it can just happen with age. There, there's, there's no, there's no, again, no dose correlation. But all we do know is the fact that there's usually a strong correlation with a ligament injury between the scapula and lunate. That's what we do know. We do not know exactly why it happens. I can tell you when they do have it, they can't put their wrist back in extension, put weight on their hand because it hurts back here. It hurts the back of their hand right here when they put weight on their hand. So that that's the big kicker is weight bearing. You you were Greg. You were talking about, uh, and I, I'm going to shut up myself. But you were talking about the the fall in the parking lot or the fall in the, on the work site. You know the 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 we were at that conference a month or so ago. We sat at a table and had lunch with some people, and they were they were the uh, the the workplace has moved. And Nicole can probably explain this better than I can because she was involved in conversation but somebody tripped over their dog during work hours at home and 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 the the conversation around the table was who's going to pay the claim because it could be workers comp it could be homeowners insurance like there was a there's all these different factors but the fact of the matter is it can be workers comp at that point because that was you know it, it happened during work hours in her work environment and uh so the the cause of the trip. <laughs> well, I think I think that would get to a point where do you, do you allow dogs at work or do you right. not? So if you don't well, allow dogs they, at work, they have like all kinds of lawyers dogs, involved in trying know? to figure it out. But the the risk is there that 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 fall is going to apply. I, I think employers are going to, have to become very specific about their work and about the work environment if they're off off site. And talk about and, and and say you know this is exempt from injury. You know if you trip on a dog, and it's your dog, and you're not supposed to have dogs at work. Then you know you got a problem here, you know because it's not going to be work related. But they're going to have to get that specific. It's kind of like McDonald's saying, "Don't drink hot coffee," right? <laughs> like this this may burn you, right? Well, that, that's that's about how preposterous I think that that is that argument is. You know, mm-hmm. common sense says, "Okay, I trip over my own dog in my own home environment. I'm working at home." But it's not your employer's fault that you have a dog. You, you know, took that risk. Saying? That was your choice. Yeah. But I, you know, well, I'll tell you, 
course, I'm biased because I'm an employer. So we were, uh, Greg. The other thing, the next, the the Rev uh, Rev Two coming out in the Ergo Algo is a home office inspection, and and that's oh, cool. well, yeah. And and I'll tell you, people don't realize it, but when you're at work at home, if you're living in a house and you go to the bathroom, and your plug, your your electrical outlet is within six foot of the uh, of a water source whether it be a commode a shower or a sink you've got to have a gfci or you're out of compl- your workplace is now out of compliance and those are things that you can see quickly but it's it it is in fact now your workplace between nine and five or whatever that looks like and you know you let somebody get electrocuted your employees are going to be playing you know i mean it's just I, I understand. I think, I think you can. I think you can definitely argue the fact that if if I don't have a way of making my home office ergonomically sound, then then I think the employer should be thinking about that. I really do. I think because that that'd be hard to argue. If I've got a porch set up with my computer, my keyboard, my mouse, my 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 chair, my monitor height, all that stuff needs to be done because that is the work environment. But I do think that that the trend is it's swung way over one side where there's a lot of people that are off work and working at home. I think it's going to swing a little bit more over to being more in the work environment. There's a big push right now for that to, have to go back that way. I think eventually when it's all said and done, we're going to see it change. But I think that home offices are going to be here to stay. It's I do too. Yeah, there's 27 million out now. So it's it's cheaper. It's cheaper on the employer. I got a big, big, a uh, big doctor's office that sits below me, and they have they have 22 billers that all work from home now, and they're saving a ton of space on office that they can use now to see more patients and do infusions and all other stuff. So it really saves overhead because they can employ more people with less space. But what they're not thinking about is making that home environment safe and making and in the long run it makes them more productive. Everybody, everybody focuses on the safety, but ergonomics and ergonomic the, the the ergonomic evaluation makes them more productive. It makes them have less waste movements and it helps their body rest to be you know be able to, to work for longer periods of time. And that's what's really what it's about. They make more money. Yeah, Greg, I'd love for you to add a column to your to your spreadsheet on the cost and add in sort of a an estimate of how long somebody loses productivity before they finally complain, right? Oh, I- because you know, there's that, that be, period. That, that's going to be a guess. I don't think there's anything published on that. I think that that, that's, it's, it, that would be more of a guess, Nicole. I, I, I don't know that other than I, I probably could add a symptoms column. Yeah. I mean, the they're picture. symptomatic for some period of time, which also means they're probably going to the doctor. They're probably, you know, losing some productivity, depending on how much their work actually depends upon that injury. And so there's that that period of time when, when and, and frankly, when I'm sitting around and I, if I am in an office environment or I'm talking to my coworkers and I'm complaining about how much my back hurts, yep. then I'm my lack of productivity and my pain is is impacting their productivity. So it's oh, it's uh, you you're know right. it's, it's exactly catching. Right. You're right, but you know we we've not even talked about you know the 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 personal risk factors that people have, you know diabetes, thyroidism, and what it does smoking. Uh, all those things have a huge impact on particularly smoking on nerve function. You know, the nerve makes up 2% of the body mass and burns 20% of the oxygen. That's a heck of a, of a statistic. 20% of the oxygen is burned by, by a, a body mass that only has 2% of your body mass burns 20% of the oxygen. It needs oxygen. So anything that impacts the oxygen transport system, a bad heart, congestive heart failure, emphysema, or smoking, all those things impact <clears throat> oxygen transport system which impacts the healthiness of the nerve. And if it, if it gets sick or doesn't get the appropriate nutrition it needs, then it becomes a problem. I talked about, you know, the awkward posture with the nerve and how the nerve, it takes two days for the nerve, the nutrition flow from the neck down the tip of the fingers. It ta- that, that's how it takes. It doesn't flow like blood. So awkward posture, overhead, forward reach, all that puts pressure on the nerve, which makes you less productive because uh, it changes the nerve flow, the neural flow. So, I mean, this is a, these, these subjects are so interesting to me and they're, and they're deep. But 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 they make sense from a functional point of view, and it makes sense why ergonomics is important, and why it's important to be to set the body up in in, in a good anatomical posture and be able to work for periods of time, you know, and and, and be productive. So I'm gonna shut up and answer questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you, we we actually need to have a uh, 
a mission control on age and workforce because you know if you look at all the things that and there's 77 million of us greg you're a boomer i'm a boomer you know three of the or four of the people on here that i see are boomers and uh you know that's we're number one we're, we're going out one every eight seconds but you look at the what we bring with us you know it's like the ball joints on my car wore out you know uh it's got two hundred fifty thousand miles so yeah, yeah that, that's that's definitely something we need. And we're, and we're working our brains out. These boom, yeah. boomers are hard, man. We're producers. We we yeah. we we were raised to work. Yeah, we work hard, and that's yeah. that's that's who we are. You yeah. know, and it's and 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 so you got a, an aging workforce that's working extremely hard, and and it's just it's going to catch us. It's just a matter of time. I predict the next five years we're going to see a huge boom in the number of injuries that we have, particularly arthritic injuries. It's going to be huge. Right. Yeah. Um, I hope that the technology keeps on, you know, going as 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 we age, so we can stay in the game. But it's it's tough. Yeah. Definitely. Any questions about what I discussed tonight? Any pathology questions or any uh, ergonomic questions? Um, this is great. I give you a big thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. A big trigger thumbs up. <laughs> Now we can. Uh, Greg, by the way, just to FYI, I was going to. I, I, uh, Albert's kind of a ringer. Uh, he's probably one of the top researchers on the planet in his line of ergonomics for the. He, he's going to be that uh, Stover schnook. He, and so, well, that's a sidebar conversation you'll you'll definitely want to have with this uh, with this guy. And uh, but yeah, no, he really is recognized globally for for a bunch of the stuff he's doing. So. I, I can tell you that that we've been doing a lot of research with with some large corporations, and we've got a huge database about over three thousand in. And we look at the dash score, the quick dash, and we can we've been we've done trending tr quick dash scores, particularly for people that are injured. And we can, I can tell you that if somebody scores above a sixty on a dash, that's a big deal. In other words, that's a that's a red flag should go off with any therapist when they when they interview them. And, and I think they probably could even do these these work dashes they have now online. But then, but then after we treat them, after four visits, if that, that dash score doesn't change at least 20 points, red flag. And if after eight visits in therapy, if that dash score is higher than 50, red flag, you're going to lose the case. And 90% of them that are above 50 after eight visits, you're going to lose the case. It's just going to go, it's going to go south. The therapist is missing something. The doctor's missing something. The patient's not in the game. Psychologically, there's something missing with this, some so social peer, the so social pressure, or something going on, they're going to fail. And I've got a huge end that can tell you that. And, it, and we published it in a lot of places, mainly journal of hand therapy, journal of hand surgery, but it is definitely looking at the minimal, minimal clinical important difference uh, in DASH scores. We've also uh, done it with disarrhythmia fractures. We've done it with uh, lateral epicondylitis. We've done it with carpal tunnel. Uh, but then we've got it for a lot of other pathologies we haven't published yet. But it's really cool to look at that and, and think about the trends and, how, and and to know that then I can I can just take and put all my effort on you know that ten percent's not doing well instead of working looking at everybody I can put my energy on those and medical management it makes a difference. So the, the, the I know that I know of two big industries right now they're doing it on site with employees when they come in as an initial valuation they use it to look at it for a trigger. They they, they 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 use it as a means to say oh they need to go to therapy they need to go see a doctor right now. Versus just, you know, just sitting on say, how how bad is it? Well, it gives you an idea how bad it is if they score more than 50 or 60 on a dash, quick dash. More than 60, that's a pretty big red flag. You probably should be getting some help. One way or the other, either psychosocial or physical help, or both. Yeah, and, and I, I was going to say, not not to, we, you know, we're, we're right at our time. Uh, Nicole, over about 85% of the people on the on the the session here are already certified in <laughs> in Ergo Algo. So uh Ray, if you would uh let's skip down. We got a couple of uh yeah, um, no worries. Yeah. Oh, there he is. All right, yep. All right, yeah, there we go. Yeah, we got some great sponsors. Uh Superfeet, it's a product that I believe in. Uh they're gonna be working with us on doing the lower ex extremity training uh never been to one for ergonomics and we're developing one uh for uh, lower extremities 
Uh, Greg owns a clinic chain uh, called Commonwealth Hand Therapy, and uh, they they're rock stars in the in the business. Uh, best hand surgeons in the world send their people to uh, to his people, and uh, of course the Ergo Algo office. That's our product, and you know we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, Atomic Ergo. That is a uh, we have a podcast that's turned out to be really good. We got a good following. We got a lot of good stuff going on. And then I wanted to touch on uh, Mousetrapper because it's a product we've evaluated. We're going to be putting a lot of uh, a lot of energy into. It's a, actually it's a European product. Uh, we have uh, we have their U.S. They had a U.S. sales. On, uh, on on with us and we're going to be uh, we're, we're going to commit some resources to you know to making people understand what that is and how it's beneficial uh greg we're probably going to be getting you to look at it from a hand perspective uh because it's a great product and we got one more slide right right yeah all right james we wanted to wish you a happy birthday brother uh you uh you know you're a you're good dude you've been in the ergo business a long time you you're recognized and uh it's uh it's good good to be working with you and like i say we're going to be doing that but we wanted to wish you a big happy birthday and i think you're 35 today we kind of discussed that earlier uh <laughs> but uh i hope you have a great birthday i uh, i know you're up in the northeast somewhere and i hope you're uh enjoying some good weather and you know we're we're grateful you joined us today, but we we look forward to to doing some things with you guys. And so, if there's nothing else, I think that uh, I'm gonna let Ray sign us off. Um, yep, and James uh, commented. He said thank you, Steve, and appreciates us. So yeah, th once again, thanks, uh, Doctor Pitts. It was awesome. Learned a lot about wrist today, and hopefully how to prevent wrist injuries for us in the future. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and sign out. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.